Hello and welcome to Bio Lessons to Go. I'm Mr. Dove, and today we'll be looking at the prokaryotic kingdoms. So, all living things, including our prokaryotes, our bacteria, are classified into a hierarchy of groups in order to facilitate their study. Organisms are going to be grouped uh, based upon physical characteristics like DNA, uh, physical similarities, and evolutionary relationships. Now, as we move from our largest group um, down to our uh, smallest group, we're getting more and more specific. For example, all of these organisms, from the grizzly bear to the sea star, belong to the kingdom Animalia because they all have uh, multicellular, they're all eukaryotes, they all have no cell walls, um, and they all are heterotrophs. They have to eat to obtain their nutrients. Now, as we classify further, um, we're getting more specific. So, for example, while kingdom is one of the larger groups, uh, phylum gets a little more specific, and so the phylum chordata would eliminate the sea star because chordates all have a nerve cord uh, that runs down uh, a, their, a, a dorsal nerve cord running down their back, and so a sea star just doesn't have that. More specifically, we'll have the class mammalia. The snake is no longer a part of this group because it is not a mammal, it's a reptile. Mammals are warm-blooded, they give milk to their young, they often have hair, um, and snakes don't have this. More specific, order carnivora. So these are all carnivores, and so now our squirrel is gone because carnivores have dentition. They have teeth which allow them to eat meat. Then we go to family, just the bear family. Our fox is not a bear, so he's eliminated. Um, and then our genus, uh, more specific uh, to bears that probably eat meat, whereas um, our panda bear doesn't and has a little more differences in terms of DNA. And then a specific bear like the grizzly bear, Ursus arctus. The idea is the more groups that you have in common, the more closely related that you're going to be. When we, so when we look at um, you know, our groupings, we can see that um, our mountain lion and our domestic cat, they definitely look a lot alike. So they're probably closely related, um, a lot more so than to the guppy. And this is going to be reflected in its classification. The more groups in common, the more closely related. For example, the two, um, all of them, uh, are animals. So they're all multicellular eukaryotic heterotrophs with no cell wall. Um, the phylum is chordata. They all have a dorsal nerve cord. Um, that happens to be um, encased in a bony structure called vertebrae. So they're going to be in the subphylum vertebrata. Where they start to differ is at the class. Both the mountain lion and the domestic cat are mammals. They both have hair and can produce you know, milk for their offspring. Whereas osteichthys, this is just a, a fish that has a bony, exos or a bony endoskeleton. Um, our cats, uh, further, will share an order because they have teeth that's good for eating meat. They're in the cat family, um, cat genus, um, but they're going to just differ at their species level. They're different uh, species of cat. So when we think of our bacteria, you think that they'd be in the same group. Well, for a long time, we did classify them into a same group called the Monera, but Upon further um, observations, we found that they have a lot more molecular and cellular differences. And as a result, they're classified into each of their very own domains. And therefore, you know, they'd be in their own kingdoms. Our basic prokaryotes, our basic bacteria, share some structural similarities. They're all going to be one-celled, and they typically have um, you know, specific shapes. They're, they can be um, rod-shaped, which we call bacilli. They can be round, which we call cocci, um, or coccus bacteria. Or they can be spiral-shaped, and spirilli. Um, when they come in pairs, we call them diplo. When they're grouped together, we call them staphylo. And when, when they're chains, they're called strepto. So, for example, uh, Streptococcus, uh, which is the bacteria that causes strep throat, if we looked at it under a microscope, 
it would be chains of little um, spheres. Now, all bacteria are very, very small, about one-tenth the size of a eukaryotic cell. Um, they're about one micron or one micrometer in size. If we looked inside of a typical prokaryote, we wouldn't see any internal compartments. They have no membrane-bound organelles. The only thing we'll see floating around in there is going to be some ribosomes because all cells need to be able to produce protein. Also floating in the cytoplasm is going to be their DNA. Um, they're going to be kind of concentrated in a region which we call the nucleoid. Um, but the DNA itself would be a little bit different from eukaryotic DNA in that um, it's going to be naked. Um, it's not going to be wrapped around those histone proteins. When bacteria reproduce, it's a little bit different than eukaryotes. Because they don't have a nucleus, they don't need to undergo mitosis. Instead, um, bacteria reproduce through a process called binary fission. The chromosomes will duplicate and separate. As the bacteria elongates, um, then it's going to be able to, to divide to create two identical daughter cells, uh, basically clones of themselves. Um, some bacteria only take like 20 minutes to divide, um, while others take a little bit longer. So if you're reproducing by fission and producing almost um, identical individuals, well, where do you get the genetic diversity? Well, the genetic diversity and bacteria come from a couple of places. First place comes from natural mutations. Anytime you're copying DNA, there's a chance for mutation. When you're reproducing every 20 minutes, there's a pretty good chance that we're going to have a mutation crop up that then is passed down to a daughter cell. What we see is about one in every 200 bacteria have some sort of mutation. Another way that they can uh, have uh, genetic diversity is through genetic recombination. Bacteria can swap genes in a number of ways. One, they can exchange plasmids. Remember, the plasmids are circular pieces of DNA that contain different um, you know, genetic instructions. For example, bacterial resistance. That way, one bacteria can pass on resistance to another, like we saw with our smooth and rough strains of bacteria um, in the Griffith experiments. Additionally, bacteria can undergo conjugation, where they're able to connect create a little conjugation tube, and then exchange DNA directly. Now, prokaryotes, in terms of their metabolic pathways, have a number of ways that they're able to obtain injury, uh, energy. Different uh, bacteria can do so in different ways. We have photoautotrophs. So we have our blue-green or cyanobacteria, which are going to do photosynthesis. Deep in the bottom of the ocean, uh, where there is no sunlight, the bacteria there are able to synthesize uh, food using the inorganic compounds of like nitrogen and sulfur and hydrogen that are being belched from within the earth. And then, of course, we've got our bacteria that are heterotrophs that have to be able to eat things in order to obtain their nutrients. So we'll have those that decompose plant and animal matter. And then we have those that actually are pathogens and will con consume living tissues. Now, of our two types of bacteria, um, uh, each one has some very specific characteristics. Um, for example, our archaebacteria, um, they do have a cell wall. All bacteria have a cell wall. But on close examination, they're missing this uh, carbohydrate amino acid complex called peptidoglycan that we see in other bacterias. Archaebacteria are capable of living in extreme environments, so we can call them extremophiles. Like here we have some hot springs, and here we're going to find very specific bacteria that can live nowhere else. They only live in this hot environment, and regular bacteria would die. Because they're able to live in these extreme environments, um, that's kind of where they get their name. The idea that they are the ancient bacteria, that their ancestors were the first to inhabit a very inhospitable earth. Um, when the earth was very different than it is today, perhaps their ancestors were the first to live. It is from these hot springs that we get uh, the enzyme responsible 
um, for being able to do PCR. Because remember, uh, PCR requires high heat in order to denature the DNA and then add the new bases. Um, and so we need an enzyme um, that's able to sustain those high temperatures. And we got it from one of the thermophile bacteria. The last piece for archaeobacteria that's really interesting to me anyways, is that um, archaeobacteria have junk DNA, just like eukaryotes. So inside our DNA, and also in the DNA of archaeobacteria, we've got coding regions that actually give us our traits. But then we have non-coding regions, junk, that gets edited out um, after transcription and the post-transcriptional process. Um, so it's strange that these one-celled organisms with no nucleus also contain this junk DNA, uh, which indicates that perhaps uh, archaeobacteria and eukaryotes have perhaps a more similar common ancestor in the past. Our typical bacteria, the eubacteria, um, doesn't live in extreme environments. We encounter these all the time. We have some that are living in our guts. Um, you know, it's, it's what we use to make yogurt. The big thing that is interesting about eubacteria is they do contain cell walls, um, which do have the peptidoglycan, um, that carbohydrate amino acid complex, but they have it in differing amounts. And as a result, um, by using a stain, a crystal violet, um, it stains different bacteria in different ways. Um, we call that gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bacteria. And this would be a basic test that the doctor could do um, because different bacteria respond differently to antibiotics. And by quickly knowing what kind of bacteria we're dealing with, we're able to prescribe an appropriate uh, course of treatment. When we think of bacteria, we oftentimes think of them as this negative thing that we want to get rid of. But bacteria are just as useful as they are harmful. Um, bacteria are responsible um, as decomposers. Um, they help to recycle the nutrients that are necessary to maintain that balance of matter. Since ma matter can't be created or destroyed, it has to be recycled back. Um, Bacteria are really important um, in soil and as a symbiotic relationship with uh, different uh, plants to be able to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. The atmosphere is where most of our nitrogen is. Um, we need to get that into tissues because it's important for producing proteins and nucleic acids. So without bacteria, we wouldn't access this essential matter and so we wouldn't be able to produce those essential macromolecules. For a lot of organisms, bacteria help with digestion. Um, in a lot of herbivores, the bacteria have uh, special enzymes like cellulase, which helps them to break down um, that branch change of chains of carbohydrates. Um, the uh, bacteria that's in our gut helps us to produce vitamin K and vitamin B12. And then lastly, but not leastly, we've discovered that we can use bacteria through uh, genetic technologies to produce food and medicine. Um, and so by using biotechnology, we're able to produce stuff like yogurt um, or insulin. And of course, we have to remember that bacteria are pathogens. They can make us sick. Uh, they can make plants sick, um, different diseases that you know, cause fruit to rot, uh, plants to wilt, um, and animal diseases, anything from tooth decay, to tuberculosis or Lyme, Lyme disease. Um, we have to find ways to be able to deal with these bacteria so that while they exist, they um, won't be but so much of a detriment to our human health. So bacteria are all around us. They're one of those microorganisms that we have to know and understand um, so that we can coexist with these organisms that are outside of our purview with the naked eye.